excited. We are in the series, The Holy Spirit, The Holy Spirit, and so many people have ideas on the Holy Spirit, so many different backgrounds in our church, so many uh, different uh, denominational backgrounds. Some people come into the, the congregation here, and maybe they've never been in church, and so you have so many different levels of thinking, so many uh, different experiences, and one of those aspects is the Holy Spirit, and we're talking about the baptism in the Holy Spirit, the baptism in the Holy Spirit, and we throw words out, and sometimes the assumption is that everybody knows what you're talking about. Everybody's tracking the same, but that is absolutely not the case when it comes to the church, and it's because we all come from different areas, and so when we say baptism, you know, many people's minds go to, oh yeah, no, I know what baptism is, and you, you think of water baptism, which that is a form of baptism. But then the scriptures talk about spirit baptism. It's about being baptized into Christ in that word. And, and so sometimes there's the same word but different meaning. Oftentimes the English language. That's why it's so difficult to, to understand when you're talking with languages. Because I could look at you and I can go, oh, that was cool. And absolutely mean that wasn't cool. I could look at you and go, oh, that's cool. And it's all just uh, voice inflection with two very different meanings. Well, Scripture sometimes, there, there's different words, and, and you think you know what that word is implying, but it's implying something. Oh, well, we're going to talk about, I'm going to give you an idea. We're going to lay some groundwork. It's going to feel a little bit like we're going to school today, but I think it's going to be a school that's going to be pretty good. I think it's going to be a school that's going to be pretty awesome, and I think you're going to like it. And honestly, we need it. Baptism of the Holy Spirit. See, the Bible teaches the importance of the Holy Spirit's role in the ministry of Jesus and the continuation of the role of the early church. And that church being empowered is still the same church today, the body of Christ. We see in Jesus' public ministry, when he was launching his public ministry, the Holy Spirit came upon him. At the beginning, the Gospels, uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Gospels, books in the Bible, all record this. Matthew 3, 13 gives us an understanding of how this looked. It says, then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan, which is a river, the Jordan River, to John to be baptized by him. And I want to take you back to this understanding of water baptism, but also the understanding of the Holy Spirit involved in Jesus' ministry there at the beginning and who John is, because sometimes we throw these names out and we just don't either know or we assume everybody knows who we're talking about. This is not John who ultimately was Jesus' disciple. This is John the Baptist. It's a different person. And here's where we see this aspect of water baptism of which we celebrate as a church. And water baptism is a public confession of a spiritual declaration. It's a public confession of a spiritual declaration. So who was John the Baptist? Well, John the Baptist was the cousin of Jesus. He was about six months older than Jesus. We don't see in Scripture where they really had this close, close relationship. But in this time, in this situation, we see where John is baptizing people. Well, who is John, John the Baptist? Well, he's the son of a priest named Zechariah, and his mother is named Elizabeth. So this priest, Zechariah, is obviously he's following the Lord and Elizabeth, his wife, and they can't have children. It appears they can't have children, but then Zechariah is doing his priestly duties and he's burning incense at the altar and the Lord comes to him in, in, the, in the, this idea of an angel coming to him. Luke 1, 8 through 17, let me give you some background and then we'll dial this in. It says, and there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. So Zechariah is doing what priests do. And Zechariah was troubled when he saw him, and fear fell upon him. It says, but the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son. And you shall call his name John. So this is John the Baptist. And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great before the Lord. And he must not drink wine or strong drink. And this is what's interesting. And he will be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. 
And it says, and he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah. He won't be Elijah. Elijah was a prophet in the Old Testament, did many great miracles in the name of the Lord. And it says he will be like Elijah. He will go forth like Elijah. He will turn people's hearts back to God and turn their hearts of the fathers to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. I started thinking, we need some Elijahs today, don't we? We need some people that will, will help be an instrument, help be empowered, understand the opportunity to be empowered by the Holy Spirit to turn people's hearts back to God with what they say. Well, this is what was happening. This was the promise of to Zechariah and Elizabeth. So John's baptism encompassed one of repentance and one of preparation for people to receive Christ and the message that he was bringing. So this is what God is setting up, and literally, uh, ultimately, the baptism of Jesus on people would be that of the Holy Spirit. So I want to give you some understanding there. So we fast forward 30 years. John is born. Jesus is born. We fast forward 30 years that Jesus is starting his public ministry. So we fast forward. Here's John, the priest's son, baptizing people in water under repentance of sins, and now Jesus has come to be baptized by John. So here's John. He's baptizing people. They're repenting of their sins. They're hearing the message of John. They're turning back to God, and all of a sudden, here comes Jesus out of the crowd. Well, John knows who Jesus is. John knows, has heard, has understood what God is doing through Jesus. Matthew 3, 14 through 17 it gives us an idea of what's going on, kind of in the mind of John, what's going on in the situation. It says John would have prevented him, literally prevented him from coming and being baptized. Like, like you don't need to be baptized. Yeah, you know, we can't. Like, I'm not going to baptize you, whatever. You know, he says he would have prevented him saying, I need to be baptized by you. And do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, let it be so now, for thus is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. This is an example. We're setting forth an example here. And then he consented. And when Jesus was baptized, so we're talking about in water, when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. What a powerful moment. I mean, what would have been awesome to have seen the skies, you know, what, what it would have looked like. It says that the Holy Spirit came upon him likened to a dove. Many of us have seen pictures in the dove, uh, uh, an actual dove coming down. Was it an actual dove? We don't know. But the, the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit coming upon him like a dove, but a voice from heaven saying, this is my son whom I'm well pleased. We see this aspect of a word that we describe this as is Trinity. We see the Trinity here. In operation, a trinity meaning that of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Not three gods, but one God operating in sync. It's, it's a powerful moment. But here's to simplify things. Because sometimes in church, I think, people begin to take a lot of information in, but are trying to figure out how do I apply this and what did that exactly mean. Let me simplify this. When a person is saved... That's a term that we use when a person is saved. Well, what does that even mean? Because the assumption is you know what that means. The assumption is, hey, you just need to be saved. Saved from what? You know, what that means is when a person is saved or converted, there's a conversion, meaning I am of the world, but now I'm a follower of Christ. No longer do I live, but Christ lives through me. Now I have a promise for eternity, a promise that, that takes me from death to life. I'm converted. I'm, I, there's conversion. I'm saved. That's what that's meaning. The Spirit baptizes us into Christ or the body of Christ. The church is the body of Christ. And in a subsequent, big words here are big concept, but, but it, it's really simple and it's meaningful. In a subsequent or in a distinct experience other than conversion, other than salvation, we would say, a person 
uh, is uh, Christ baptizes a person in the Holy Spirit. In other words, you have to be saved. You have to be a follower of Christ before you can be baptized by the Holy Spirit with power. You can't say, I want all the power that God has, but I'm not going to follow him. And I think a lot of people get confused there because they're not a follower of Christ, but they'll pray, God, just give me power to do this. Give me power to be this. Give me power in this situation. You're his representative. To just give you power would mean really ignorance. It would mean that he would empower you in such a way that the world would look at you and go, wow, that's a lot of power. I want what they have. But the truth is, you, don't, you have the power, but you don't have the, the authority. You don't, have, you don't have the willingness to obey the one who can empower. So it doesn't work. And a lot of people are at this level going, I just, I've asked God. I've asked him to give me power. I've asked him to just to, to give me what I need in this situation. I'll bring glory and honor to him. But the truth is, is, Really, behind the scenes, you're not willing to follow him. You're not willing to submit your will, your, your will to him. Well, that's how this works. So water baptism is, is simply that public, that public declaration. I'm a follower of Christ. No longer do I live, but Christ lives through me. You go down, you come up. It's a spiritual thing. Now you're set up. For the baptism of the Holy Spirit to be empowered to live this life. So they're two distinct things, these baptisms. Two distinct things. We have to understand that. I want to take you to when Jesus died and he rose from the dead. I want to take you to this point. And he had, he had been walking with his disciples, we'll see here in the scripture, for 40 days after his, his resurrection. So Jesus has died he has rose from the dead. He's walking with his disciples. He's, he's teaching them. We've moved on some three, three and a half years from the time he was water baptized by John. We're moving forward. It says Acts 1, 3 through 5. It said he presented himself, this being Jesus, alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father. Key here, which he said, you heard from me, for John baptized with water. He says, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So again, Jesus is talking about there's two things going on here of baptism. So what is the baptism of or in the Holy Spirit, or some people will say the baptism of or in the Holy Ghost. What is that? Well, by definition, Crosswalk is part of the Assemblies of God, and by definition, our official perspective at a church level is the baptism of the Holy Spirit is God's promise to every believer who wants to do greater things for God and wants to live a life completely pleasing to him. So here's the, the most distinguishing features. It's not just saying, I'm baptized in the Holy Spirit. I have the power of God. You either have it or you don't. You know, a lot of people are saying, oh, yeah, I'm baptized in the Holy Spirit, but there's no power in their life. There's no evidence of that in their life. I think we miss something. So here's some distinguishing features of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And they're this, number one, it's theologically, big word just means your belief in God, your belief in how God works in and through your life. It's a theologically and experientially distinguishable from and subsequent to new birth or salvation. It's what I said before. It's, it's different. The baptism of the Holy Spirit in your life is different than salvation. Sometimes those happen very close together. Sometimes those happen in the same uh, time frame, it appears, but you're saved and then you're, you're baptized. For some people, they're saved and Maybe this, this just hasn't happened. This is something that's held off. This is something that is, is still being sought out. You're still considering. You're still thinking about it. It's different. Uh, number two, it's, it's accompanied what we see in Scripture more times than not with speaking in tongues. See, some of you in your background, you're like, man, that's, that's the deep end of the pool. I try to stay out of that. I, I'm more the floaty kind of person, and I just kind of, 
stay in that area. Uh, what we see in Scripture, and again, you've heard me say this so many times, if all you had was the Bible, it's enough. And what we see in Scripture is that when it speaks of the baptism of the Holy Spirit in someone's life, that they were speaking in tongues, we'll look at the Scriptures and let the Scripture stand. And it's distinct in purpose from the Spirit's work of salvation or regenerating a heart unto God and a life of a repentant sinner. It's different than that. It's, its purpose is distinct to be a witness to, to go forward into areas that you couldn't make a difference on your own. We see this in Scripture. So I want to do greater things for God, don't you? I want to position myself in such a way that I receive everything God has for me. Well, in doing that, I've got to submit my will to him. That's the whole lordship of Christ, that when we pray, when we are saved, we say, no longer do I live, but you live through me, Lord. It's your way above my way, Lord. My way is subject to you. And I want whatever power is available to me. And I want you to know the power that's available to you. And again, Jesus, uh, uh, take you back to this time. Uh, Jesus, he's, he's resurrected from the dead. He's bringing his followers to him, his closest He's bringing them together. He's laying out the plan, what this is going to look like, because he's getting ready to leave. Acts 1, 6 through 8, he says, So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel, or to Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. What, what's interesting here, these, these followers, I mean, they have walked very close with him. They have seen in their minds tragedy, he's beaten, he's killed, but he's resurrected. There's a glorious time. There's a powerful time going on here. Jesus is speaking to them. He's laying it out, and they're going, all right, you ready to take back the kingdom? They're still thinking a physical kingdom. They're still thinking, hey, we're going to overthrow the government. When are you doing that, Lord? How's that going to play out? They're not getting it. They were missing what Jesus was saying. I think sometimes we can do that, can't we? We're like, God, let's just take it by storm. Lord, let's just right the wrongs. Use me, oh God, empower me. Well, he may do that, but oftentimes it's in a different context than what we're thinking as it was here. Their minds were still thinking overthrow. Their minds were still thinking back to a physical throne and kingdom. And Jesus follows up with this familiar scripture to many, Acts 1.8. He says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Yeah, he had a power for them to be a witness. What kind of witness? A witness uh, about him, a witness about what he's done, a witness about what he offers, a witness of the good news of the gospel. Power to be a witness of Jesus Christ. Power to be a witness to live with one another in unity and love, bonded together under the, the, the power of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit in their lives, power to be a witness ultimately to the furthest reaches of the world. In the account of Matthew's gospel, you have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Matthew's gospel gives us some clarity to some of what Jesus had said to them at the time of his ascension because he's going back to heaven. He had told them, I'm going to leave. I'm going to go prepare a place for you. He says this, Matthew 28, 18 through 20, he says, And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. All authority. That's a lot of authority. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. So here's the marching orders baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. He says, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. That's the marching orders. That's a bold march. <laughs> that's, a, that's a way out of our league march. To go into all the world? Oh, God, I don't have enough power for that. Exactly. That's why I've provided you the Holy Spirit. You have to have the Holy Spirit. Well, Lord, just, just save me. I just want to live in eternity. I just want to buy into what you have for me sometime later. And God's going, no, you're missing. That's why I'm giving you the Holy Spirit, because your work's not done. If everybody took a deep breath here right now, 
and let that air out, if you could do that, the truth is God's not done with you. God still has plans for you. I mean, so many people are going, well, what could he ever do through me? Well, probably not much with your power. But with his, the marching order is to go into all the world. That's why we need the Holy Spirit. No, salvation is just enough for me. And we miss. You say, well, isn't that okay? I don't think it is. I don't think it is. I think we sell God short of what God can do and desires to do in and through us. So we need him for that. See, there's a baptism in water, which is repentance, that public confession of being a follower of Christ. But there is also this aspect of a spirit's baptism, the Holy Spirit's baptism in our life. And I want to talk about three aspects of it. So let's drive down and try to bring some application to where you live and how you live your life. First, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is a promise. Baptism of the Holy Spirit is a promise. I love promises, especially from God, because he keeps them, amen? There was a great outpouring, what they called the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts. Acts is a, is, is a name of a book in the New Testament, and it's a lot of the history of the church. It's, it's a lot of the history of, of Paul, the Apostle Paul, of his missionary journeys, and, and it's the outpouring of the Holy Spirit In the book of Acts, Acts chapter 2, verse 1 through 13, says when the day of Pentecost had arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. What an awesome time. What a powerful time. Looking around going, is that a train? (laughs) Get it? They didn't have trains? Okay. Yeah. All right. Says verse 3, and divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. Wouldn't that be amazing? I mean, get that picture in your mind. You say, that's scary. That's, you know, sometimes the things of God are scary, but you go through it with him, we stand in awe. We're empowered. We're not repelled. Look at it. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. It says, now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound, the multitude came together. I want you to get that. At this sound, the multitude came together. What God was doing was drawing people in. See, I think sometimes we think God's doing something and people are running away and we're going, no, come back, come back, come back. When God's truly in something, it draws people in. It's magnetic. They, they, they're checking it out maybe, but there's something about it. I want to know more. I want to be drawn in. Man, this is amazing. This is powerful. That's the Holy Spirit in operation in believers' lives. That's what was happening here. And the multitudes are hearing this. And they came together and they were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. The power of the Holy Spirit helps us to speak in that language that, that begins to draw this world in. That's our mission, church. They were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? Like this doesn't translate. They don't talk like that. And how is it that we hear each of us in his own native language, Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia and Judea and Cappadocia and Pontus and Asia and Phrygia and Pamphylia and Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians. We hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. I mean, this is a God moment. This is a God thing. This is Holy Spirit empowered. You ever been in a situation and you go, I just feel like I need to say something. I just feel like I need to, I I just don't know how to talk to them. I just, you need the Holy Spirit. I just don't know how to articulate to them about God. And so I'm just, I'm just going to pray for them. Holy Spirit, get a hold of them. See, can it work that way? It does, but scripturally, it usually doesn't. Scripturally, God uses his people to do his work. That's why we're ambassadors. He puts us in. 
You say, yeah, but I just, I, I feel so inadequate. Yeah, that's why you need the Holy Spirit. It says, oh, we're amazed, perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others, mocking, said, ah, they are filled with new wine. I mean, you're always going to have those in the crowd. Because the best they could come up with is, ah, you know what, they're drunk. I've, I've talked to a lot of drunk people over, over my lifetime. I've been involved in a lot of ministry where you have a lot of addicts. And drunks are pretty easy to, to deal with sometimes and get them to pray a sinner's prayer. They don't remember they did it, but... Think about a drunk is oftentimes when they are in, in the heat of the moment, they aren't real articulate. They're definitely not speaking languages in multiple facets that people are hearing <laughs> mighty works of God. Uh, now, they think they're articulate, right? So they're not drunk. These are just normal people that have positioned themselves to be saved and empowered by the Holy Spirit. We gotta, we gotta lean into this church because on a broad scale, there's a lot of people who are professing being a Christian, but there's a lot of people that are missing the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, the baptism of the Holy Spirit in their life. And that's not God's fault. His word is clear. Peter, he begins to explain, I love this, the one who was constantly getting his self in trouble by putting his foot in his mouth. Lots going on here. Uh, w language is being translated. It's being articulated. It's being said. People are being drawn to God. They're being amazed. They can't believe what is happening. And Peter, of all people, he's the one that stands up to explain it all. He begins to explain the message that Jesus is the Messiah, the Savior of the world, and how Jesus wants to provide and fulfill a promise of the Holy Spirit. Acts 2, 38 through 39. Remember, this is the promise. Acts 2, 38 through 39. And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins. And, and some people, let me pause here for a second, have taken what Peter said here and developed a whole doctrine about Jesus only. Some of you may come from that background. Well, Peter said it right here that we're to be baptized in the name of Jesus only. That's not what he's saying here. What he's saying, he's bringing a clarity on Jesus as the Messiah to be baptized into Jesus' salvation. He says, every one of you, in the name of Jesus, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise, here it is, is for you and for your children and for all who are far off. Some people go, well, that was for then. Listen to the rest of it. Everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. So is God not calling Christians today? <laughs> Oh, that was for then. He was only saving people then. If that's the case, we're lost, church. Well, I don't think that's the case. I don't think Peter was placing an ending on something. I think Peter was establishing the beginning, the ongoing, the power of God, of salvation through Jesus Christ, and the awesome opportunity of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It's a promise. It's a promise. The Holy Spirit baptism was a promise of Jesus that followed salvation. So to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you have to be saved. We'll deal with that at the end of service. The second aspect of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is for everyone who is saved. Everyone who is saved. It's not just for the elect, the super Christians. It's not just for somebody who desires it. It's for everyone. Acts 2, 39, it says, for the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. The mission to go into all the world requires the infilling. I believe this with all my heart. I see it in the scripture. The infilling, the empowering, and ultimately the baptism of the Holy Spirit to fulfill the call based on the promise. Jesus said, go into all the world. Go into all the world. I, I mean, we need his power to do that. 
We don't just need a promise of eternity in our life. We need his power to fulfill that call. So thirdly, the baptism of the Holy Spirit's for today. Here's the, here's the truth. It's either for today or it's not. It's either for today or it's not. When you read the scriptures, you either assess, okay, yeah, that's for today. No, nope, that's not for today. If it's not for today, where do you go with that? Because where did you get that? Because it's not there in the scripture. So I believe it's for today. If all you had was the Bible, again, could you really say the baptism of the Holy Spirit to be witnesses to the ends of the earth is not for today? Could you really say that? You could say it, but you wouldn't be able to back it up with Scripture. When Jesus ascended into heaven, he, he goes to heaven, he gave a promise of the Holy Spirit to his disciples with an understanding of what it would do for them. And get this, when Jesus makes a promise, you want it, and he means it. <laughs> when, Jesus makes a, when, when Jesus provides a promise, when he gives you a promise, you want it, and he means it. It's not like, I promise to do this, but, you know, if you don't, you know, it's not that big a deal. It, Jesus doesn't work that way. Uh, they would be witnesses ultimately to the ends of the earth. That calling, that commission still applies. It applies to us. However, his promise was tied all together with another hope, a future hope, of his return. He's coming back, amen? He's coming back. Acts 1, 9 through 11, it says, And when he said these things... I close with this. When he said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up. What a powerful moment. And a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven, and as he went, so here's this group of people. It's a smaller group. Two men stood by them in white robes. This just says, behold. It means they just kind of appeared. It just like came about. And they said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? It says, this Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. He's coming back, church. Yep, he left. He went in the clouds, but he's coming back in the same way. Same way. It's going to be likened to that. You say, well, I just don't believe that. Where do you get that? I just don't know about the Holy Spirit and all that, so I'm just going to sit here with the stuff that I know, but I'm not going to explore anything. If it's in the Word, it's worth exploring. You say, well, I just don't get into the Word. That's your problem. Well, it's just overwhelming. Okay. We can come up with every excuse we want to come up with. I find that people do what people want to do. People make time for what people want to make time for. So I don't have the time. If I offered you a trip to Hawaii, I bet you'd find time for it. Well, it, it would be hard, whatever. <laughs> it's so hot and everything. Well, then I, what if I sent you to Alaska for free? Put you on an Alaska cruise. But you're so busy, I know you probably wouldn't do that. Well, you know, we make time for what we make time for. What we want to make time for. Are you making time for the things of God in your life? I mean, it's that simple. Well, you know, I got saved when I was a kid. And I just, you know, I just trust the Lord. Can I tell you, there's so much more than just trusting the Lord. Can you imagine the disciples of Jesus going, oh yeah, that sounds good. Yeah, we'll come follow you. We're just going to trust you. We're just going to trust you. And they gave their lives, literally. He said, well, I'm just not into it that much. See, here's the thing. When he empowers us, we, we have to know that what we see right now is not it. This isn't all. I mean, to give your life over to Jesus Christ, you may have another 50, 75 years in you. For some of you, I, I got some young students in here, you may have another close to 100 years in you. You know what? How are we spending those years? Because eternity is at stake. Eternity is at stake. God wants to empower us. You know, you were given the opportunity to take a communion cup when you came in. If, if you want to receive communion, celebrate communion together, which maybe you didn't get that, would you just raise your hand? The ushers will look around. They'll, they'll come bring that to you. If you didn't get communion, yeah, we got one down here. Just raise your hand real high so they can see it. Here's how this starts, though. 
I want all the power that the Holy Spirit has. I want all the power that God has for me. The baptism of the Holy Spirit. I want it all. I want everything. I desire it all. I desire for him to empower my life to live for him, to live with him, to go through things that, that in the world, they, it, would, it would level people, but I could go through it. See, life happens. Happens to believers and unbelievers. I'd rather go through it with his power. Amen? You say, I want all that. It starts right here. That relationship. You've heard me say it. I confess with my mouth. The Bible says, Jesus is Lord. I believe in my heart that God raised him from the dead with that confession and belief I'm saved. That confession and belief I'm saved. If you say, well, you know, I believe in Jesus. I believe, yeah, I believe, you know, he died and rose from the dead. I just don't know if he, I mean, you know, I, I've just known some really good people that didn't believe that way. And I just think God's okay with that. Okay. Can I just, can I just tell you, you're not a believer. You're, you're not a Christian. If you don't hold that Jesus is the only way, he is the truth and he's the life. And you say, well, that's just so hard and that's so difficult. No, that's the Bible. Well, then I don't know if I believe the Bible. Then you're not a Christian. Well, no, I, I want to be a Christian. Okay. Then Jesus is the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except through him. That's not my words. That's the word of God. That's the Bible. Well, it just seems so inclusive. It is. Jesus, the only way, trusting him, following him, that no longer do you live, but Christ lives through you. Well, I just, I don't know. I mean, I think God uh, allows me to have my own rights and my own way, and I should be able to choose. Yeah, how'd that work out for Adam and Eve? They did what God told them not to do, and they got kicked out of paradise. I say, well, I just, you know, grace and mercy, grace and mercy. I love Grace and Mercy Church, but it's not given to us so that we can continue in our sin. You say, well, I just don't have the power to... No, 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 wait, wait, stay over here. Okay, let's, let's talk about it. I mean, if you want Jesus on your terms, that doesn't exist. I just... I don't know if I believe in that kind of Jesus. Okay. Then you have a Bible of your own making. I know this sounds like this, this puts you in a corner, right? People come out fighting in a corner. We either believe the Bible or we don't. We either believe that Jesus is who he says he is or he's not. It starts with that relationship. Can I tell you, he loves you so very much. Oh, the, the grace and mercy he extends to my life. Oh, my word. I look at my life. I thank God I'm not what I used to be, but I'm not what I think I'm going to be. I, I, I got to grow. I have to grow in him. I have to mature in him. That, and I need the power of the Holy Spirit to do it. I can just uh, stay in that relationship of belief. Yeah, I believe you are who you say you are. And then just kind of go on life my own way. Do I lose my salvation? Do I, you know, that line, I don't know where that line is. Try living that way with somebody you're close to. Try living that way with your spouse or your best friend. I just believe we're best friends, but we don't ever talk. I just believe we're spouses, but we just kind of live together. We just, you know, we, we, we're married. That's it, you know, and so it's all good. We've got to grow in our relationships. The Lord's the same way.